Hello, beautiful human. I'm Zach. Uh, that is Dan. We welcome to the studio. Lay there. Hey. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm standing ovation. Standing ovation. Wow. I'm so honored. I'm I'm, uh, very, I'm so honored to be in your presence. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I'm honored to be in your presence. <laughs> no, genuinely, so. it's crazy. You are. I mean, you're you're. I'm so excited to talk to you. I'm excited to talk to you. <laughs> I, your music is incredible, and it's only recently, and maybe in like the last few months, really hit my my radar, and I've gone down the deepest of holes, but I also soak in all of your stuff almost daily. Your music is great. Thank you. And thank you, you, you're so fascinating. So thank you for being here. Oh my God, of course, of course. I found it, this kid I was dating, kid, man, this man I was dating <laughs> is who introduced me to your music. Oh, thank you, kid. Yeah, no, man. no, he's a, he's a man. He's very old. Not very old, but like no, the, of appropriate age. In the, in, he's in, in his what, mid-20s. Yes. There You're you really fuck. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we don't talk anymore and I block their number. It's so, okay, that happens. Yeah, this was the best gift they gave me. Oh, well, I'm I'm happy that, that this happened. <laughs> brings me a lot of joy. Uh, there's, I, it's very rarely that like there's so much to go over and so much music to dissect, and I'm so fascinated that I'm almost slightly overwhelmed <laughs> because your history is really interesting. You, you, your earliest memory is having a violin in your hand, right? Cello. A cello. Oh well, I guess violin as well. Yeah. But do you remember the first time you actually played it? Yeah, I actually. Yeah, I did. I was given a violin when I was like two or three because. I come from a family of violinists, but um, but I was kind of like, I don't want to play violin. Like, it's too high-pitched, so I started playing cello. What was it about, I mean, obviously, right, your grandfather was a professor, right? Yeah. And it is a huge instrument was in your family. Your sister also started playing, but what was it about strings in particular that you were into? You know, so I started playing piano when I was four. That was kind of just like the standard, like both me and my twin, we were both put on piano. And then when we were like seven or eight, like we both got violins. And I, I think it was just the natural progression of like, we are string players in this family. So, you know, you each get a violin. And I was like, I don't really, I always had like a deeper voice. I was like, I'm the older twin. So I don't know if somebody thought it was really cute that. I would be the one to play cello. And I immediately was just drawn to it. I think I was excited to have, like, my own thing. Um, so, yeah. It, it, that is a part of being a twin, right? Is being able to have something that is your own when you share so much with somebody else. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was, like, I was excited. And then we can play, we played together as well, which is a lot more fun when you play two different instruments. Do you remember the first time you ever wrote a, a song? Because writing a song is different than playing an instrument, obviously. I do, yeah. I like, well, I was, so I used to, I played a lot. I sang a lot, but, you know, when you're a classical musician, you're not necessarily a creator of music. You're like a player of music. Um, but when I started singing, everyone was like, you should write, you should write. And I was so sheltered. I was so scared of writing. Um, but I... I wrote my first song when I was like 16. It was almost like a country song. I was listening to a lot of Taylor Swift at the time. So it kind of just made sense at the time. I still do. But um, so, and then I was so, I put it out and I was so freaked out by it. And I was like, all of a sudden, like so scared of it that I immediately took it down. And I didn't write another song until I was like 20. Well, I found that really fascinating because you, you go and do like the 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 re like I don't want to say reality show, but the competition show rounds in Iceland. But you wait five years between your last like I think you were on The Voice and releasing an original record. Yeah, that's a long time. It is a long time. Yeah, I think I was just trying to understand like what kind of music I wanted to make. Like I was always like a jazz singer kind of I the songs I wanted to sing were jazz and the ones I was you know and I listened to mostly jazz music but then I played classical music and you know had this deep love for classical music but then I was like you know listening to Taylor Swift every day so it was you know this kind of like odd mix of different things I wanted to do like I was I wanted to be a songwriter but I didn't I didn't know how to like bring my all these different voices I had in my head together and it wasn't until I uh, went to college I went to Berkeley um, that it kind of I found this like 
world between the three where it just kind of made sense and it clicked. And the first song I wrote where it kind of all came together was the song Street by Street that I ended up recording and ended up being my first single. Which is, I mean, how many how many songs do you write that you didn't think were good enough before Street by Street? Like one. Really? Yeah, it was all very, I, I, I like to think that just all my musical education and everything was just leading to this point, kind of. Yeah, it's it wasn't it wasn't many like maybe one or two. And then that country song that you did really early on. Yes, <laughs> maybe I'll maybe I'll fish that one out someday for the bit. But for the bit, yeah. Honestly, I was listening. I found it the other day. I was listening. It was like, I was like, not bad. Like not bad for a sixteen year old. <laughs> like um, it was cute. Street by street is incredible. Oh, I, thank you. I start listening to the song and I'm listening to it. And I'm listening to it. And I'm listening to it. I don't expect it, but I, then I start fucking crying because it really <laughs> is this, it, it's this record that is about taking back what is yours that you chose to share with somebody else. Yeah. It's, it was, you know, kind of my first, I was a very sheltered kid. I was such an orchestra nerd, you know, I just didn't really, I didn't date. I didn't, you know, I didn't go to parties in high school. And then I moved to, to Bo- from Iceland to Boston for university and all of a sudden I'd become like overnight like a young woman and I was no longer known as a twin you know I didn't my twin sister went to university in Scotland so all of a sudden I had this new identity of being like a young woman a musician and and I you know I started dating a bit and like just like being like a young woman in a new city and I had all of a sudden these new experiences to write about um and that's kind of how I, I became a songwriter, I think. I had all these thoughts in my head that I needed to let out that I'd usually, like, you know, speak to my twin sister about, and she wasn't there, so I just wrote them into, started journaling and writing them into songs. That, is Street by Street, does that start as a journal entry that you... Yeah, I still have it. I So, basically, like, I, I had my heart broken kind of for the first time, and, and I remember thinking... Now looking back, like, I was definitely a bit dramatic about it. But, you know, it's like the first time when your heart is a bit shattered. And I remember just thinking, I was like, everybody goes through this. Like, this is so painful. Um, And I spent every weekend going to New York because I just didn't want to be in Boston. Like, everything reminded me of this boy. And and I wrote in my journal, I have to take back my city and and take back my life. Um, And I went back and, and I wrote to my dorm room after this New York trip and I finished writing the song and 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 I was like it just something clicked I just remember I was like so excited after I wrote it I was like wait I think I've like found my sound and it's cool I remember I brought it to you know some songwriting professors and because I was taking I took one songwriting class and and they were like yeah it's interesting it's kind of like a mix of like the great American songbook and like but it's like, you know, new. And and I remember thinking like, oh, maybe I've like hit on something unique here. Um, and then that's kind of the way I've been writing since. But something that is so uniquely you, yet so timeless in the way it sounds, right? Because I think only somebody with your musical ability that was ingrained in you from the very early stages and then like Ella Fitzgerald filling your, your space, like it's kind of built, it, it, it started so early. Do you get what I'm saying? Like, yeah. And, Everything I'm assuming is live instrumentation, right? Yeah. Because like, yeah, especially so for for my next album, I was really, I really decided to lean kind of into my roots. The the first EP and album, I was kind of like, because I knew I wanted to take jazz music and and classical sounds and strings and stuff and and introduce it to a new audience of listeners who'd never listened to this kind of music before, and but I didn't know how far I could poke into that because. Nobody had really done it yet before. So there was kind of like a mix of I had some more like lo-fi production and mixing in a little bit like of just more modern production elements. And then what I found after my last album was that the songs that were that my audience seemed to enjoy the most were the songs that sounded like jazz standards or the ones that were literally recorded with a symphony orchestra. To my joy, because those are that's my favorite music to make, and and that's what comes most naturally to me. That's like my natural inclination. Like, so for this next album, that's what I really, really leaned into. So everything on this next album is live, and there's no MIDI, no synth, or any type of 
you know, beat in that way. Everything's like live music, uh, I, musicians playing. I had never heard scatting and hooks in one song before <laughs> in my life. And you've done that. Yeah, somehow somehow I've implemented scatting into um into <laughs> into this modern what? musical <laughs> atmosphere. Yeah. It's incredible. <laughs> it's uh it's definitely something. I also think you're gonna break a rule that is uh very much attached to Berkeley, which is uh the successful people don't graduate. I know. You graduated. I did graduate. Yeah. And I think you may be the, 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 the only the, one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, call me, call me old fashioned, but <laughs> I was, yeah, well it was, you know, it was kind of, you know, a good, a good sequence of events. Like I, I was really fortunate. I had a presidential scholarship from there, so it covered all the costs and everything. Casual. It was like they they invested a lot in me and I, and I felt you know a duty to kind of continue my studies and and I spent the bulk of them it, during COVID online, so it actually allowed me to you know continue in school whilst pursuing this career because I started like the second that COVID, the second we were thrown off campus essentially, I I released Street by Street like two or three weeks after that. And I started posting videos online and it kind of grew from that. So because and it was online and because I wasn't, because I had this scholarship, I was like, there's no reason not to. And I'm a bit old fashioned and I, I felt like I wanted a college degree. Respect. <laughs> what do you think Billie Eilish heard in a, in Street by Street that made her even share it, right? It was her, Willow Smith early on. There, it, the song gains traction pretty quickly. I... Well, Billy, I think she heard I covered one of her songs. I think that's how she, you know, found me, if you will. I, I did like a cover of, um, I forget the name, My Future, is that what it's yeah, called? Yeah. yeah. And because um, it's such a jazzy song. So and I think that's how she, she noticed me. But um, but yeah, I, I just didn't know what to expect. Like I truly like had, you know, like a private personal Instagram at that point and <laughs> I'd, I'd kind of grown, a, I was like posting videos of me singing jazz standards online and, and of the songs I'd written that kind of sounded like standards. So I started growing a little bit of a following, but you know, you never know. I like, you know, put my song through distro kid, like on my own. I had no clue what I was doing. I remember like putting, like, I didn't remember what, which category to put it in. It like didn't make sense to me, but I was like, whatever, I'll just like throw it out. And like everything was probably, the credits were probably all like wrong and whatever, but yeah, I just, I don't know. I think it was such a weird time. It was such a vacuum of time. It was in the first three weeks of lockdown, right? So I had no clue what was happening. I kind of felt like I had absolutely nothing to lose. It was just like, it still felt like a project, like a school project almost. But is there something there that you don't want to lose or you've still been able to hold on to? Because since that record, you end up releasing a bunch of songs, <laughs> a ton of songs. Well, I mean, we're at a sophomore album already. Yeah. <laughs> Which is, his, you know, you ask anybody, a sophomore album is both exciting and nerve wracking. Yeah. Well, I think, I don't know. I've, I've, I've just wanted to, I've, I haven't really had a reason to stop. I, I just enjoy it so much. I'm also, I'm not too protective about the music I make. You know, if I, if I write a song and I like it, I'll produce it out with a producer. And, and once it's produced out, I'm usually quite pleased with it. And I find no reason to not release it. I think I really romanticize this. You know, you look at like Ella Fitzgerald discography or like, you know, Miles Davis discography. And there's just like albums on albums and many different versions of the same song. And I think that's so beautiful. And and I, I figured, especially for, you know, your first few projects, it's like, just let it out so you can grow. Like, I don't think you can grow as a musician if you don't release the you know, the first, like, innocent, like, EP, you know, stuff like that. So I all kind of see it as a way of growing. So how do you know something is done if it's more seen as a part of growth rather than... Well, I, it doesn't feel like growth in the moment. Because in the moment, I always think it's the best thing I've ever made. Mm -hmm. And then I, like, release it. And now, like, like, for example, like, my album, I definitely was, like that's the best music I'll ever make. Like that was so perfect. And now after I've made the second album, I'm looking back and I was like, that was really cute. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's like looking back. But 
do you end up learning things about yourself through these records or through these albums? Absolutely. Yeah. I learned so much about myself and what I like and what I dislike. And also like once it's out, how the world perceives it, like, you know, there's so much to be learned about putting music out. I don't know if I would have dared to go full like live instrumentation, lean more into my mm. like jazz roots for this next album if it weren't for releasing the last album and seeing, you know, how it was received by the fans. Street by Street, does that help you releasing that record or writing that record actually take back what was yours? A hundred percent. Every time I play it in Boston now, I like, <laughs> I just like I'm near tears because I just think it's so cool. And um, yeah, I think that's another reason. Like I, I write these songs and I let them out. It's also just on a human level to grow. Like it literally is turning a situation that was kind of difficult at the time into into something something cool, something you can monetize. Even. <laughs> <laughs> Valentine, <laughs> if it goes well, <laughs> yeah. Valentine is really an incredibly unique record and a interesting take on and my, my the way I received it is excitement and happiness to have a valentine and then the pressure that comes with it yeah <laughs> and then like why the fuck do i have it <laughs> exactly yeah it's kind of that first like valentine is a great example of something i look back on and i'm like yeah that's really like what was going through my head at 21 um which is really cute i feel like i have this like you know i've, I've journaled out my life via song which is like what a wonderful way to it's a great biography really but um but yeah, it's kind of, you know, that first time when you're like, oh my God, like, do I have a Valentine? And am I in love? And then being like, oh shit, <laughs> <laughs> what do I do now that I have something to lose? So, yeah. I've also, <laughs> I've also noticed that in a couple of your records, you quantify a lot of, uh, you, you, you quantify things in time, right? Like it's a, a set number of days. Yes. And you've yeah. done it more than once. And oh, yeah. It, it, number of days you've gone without talking to somebody. Yeah. Number of days it's taken you to even remotely move on. Yeah. Is that rooted in your actual reality? Yeah, absolutely. I, I get such a kick out of making songs, like, very close to, like, wh my experience with whatever situation I'm writing about. So, like, 16 days. I love writing that in. I don't know why. I just, like, get so... I don't know. It makes me... It makes me so excited that I can write a song so close to what happened and then let it out into the world. It was like 16 days and then I think it was 20 something days. In another yeah, record. there's 20, 21 days to get over, get over a person in, in street by street, 16 days of not talking and promise. Yeah, it's uh, I love it. I love the uber specific stuff. I think that comes from, you know from all the jazz music that I love because those standards are so specific. They, they speak because they often come from musicals as well. Right. So, you know, you only have a couple of moments to kind of explain exactly what's happening. So I, that's why I love like describing like very literally like food, time, how it smells, what people are wearing situations like that. You I can see it. Fun. Yeah. It's very literal. It's it, you, you take that from, an, an older style of music but also in the same breath like people very much attached to the nuance right like the the uber specific details like yeah well that's what makes every song a little movie yeah yeah sick no, <laughs> you're really incredible i'm oh, like you, you have no idea like uh best friends one of my favorite songs of all time oh really yeah it's really good that's a cute one do you that's play that for your best friend of of course yeah no. I th that's like i kind of i wrote that one because i'd been writing a lot of sad songs that was like well that was one of the lines that i picked up on which is <laughs> uh i've never laughed so much that i haven't written a sad song yeah it's i that was like one of the first jazz i think like the movies and best friend i wrote those like in the same week and they were both like my first time writing like a song in kind of like a jazz format and um because street by street's like a little bit more of like a mix of a pop but like like the movies and best friend were like just kind of like jazz form and and i remember having such a kick out of that i was like wait no one's stopping me like i can fully do this i can just write a song that sounds like a jazz standard and and better than that i like posted little snippets of it online and 
people seem to really like it. I was like, oh my God, like there might be something here. How does a record really start for you? Is it with, do they all start with a story you need to tell or is it production? Or not production, but like, is it like a, a melody in your head or instruments that you hear? Always a concept or a title. Got it. I, I always write out from like some sort of idea. For, for this next album, it was almost all like writing out from titles. Um, titles that are connected to what in your life? Just just anything. And I'll like, for example, like I'll write down like the word promise. I was like, that could be a song. And then I'll write a song about something that I'm feeling and I'll just like connect those together. Um, or like there's a song. When does this come out? Um, I don't know. That's a good question. Either way. <laughs> From the start, for example, that I, I knew I wanted to write a song about like, you know, this this kind of like confession, this silly confession of love. Like I've loved you from the start. So I just wrote a whole song leading up to from the start. I think that's why a lot of my songs end with kind of like a punchline or like a sentence or end like the hook will end with the title because I'm always writing towards something. Uh, so it's almost like I'm writing chapters of a book or like a like a musical. <laughs> Bewitched, the album. I knew that the album was going to be called Bewitched before I writ- wrote any of the songs. Wh- why? Where does that come from? I just wanted to write an album called Bewitched. I thought I wanted to write a love album and I thought it was the perfect word over, you know, being in love, but it feeling like there's a, like a spell being cast on you. Because the love is so intense? Because the love is so confusing. Mm. It feels like you have like not that much control over it and there's some sort of like ominous air over it. That's kind of how you explain it. Where do you think, it, what, is that air attached to losing somebody? Is it attached to Yeah, toxicity? I think it's attached to like losing somebody. It's it's all the uneasiness between, you know, you have you have love and you have heartbreak. I write about everything in between, which is basically what I've experienced. Like, I think it's very rare that I experience like the deep love or the deep, deep, heartbreak it's all the confusion in between and i think bewitched is just kind of like a good way to explain that in between do you choose not to write about the deep stuff on both sides that book in the middle i mean i i do but there's always like i ask a lot of questions in my music it's like there's always like some sort of air of curiosity around it and it does genuinely feel like you're talking to somebody yeah i i talk the the way i write is very much the way i speak yeah it's it's uh yeah it's very connected (laughs) questions for the universe questions for the universe is a is a great example of of this that like i just have so i pose so many questions in my music because again it's like i think for me music and writing is very much a way of discovering more about myself and discovering more about the world questions for the universe is truly just a string of questions i had for the universe (laughs) and do you get answers um not yet (laughs) For some of them, they're slowly they're slowly starting to come together. And the truth is, like, I've know, definitely grown a lot since the first songs I've written. Well, and at the end of the day, like these songs, they live forever, right? So yeah, answers can come exactly when they're meant to come. Yeah, and I can like answer them later in songs as well. Ooh, mm-hmm. have you been doing that so far? I have, yeah. <laughs> really? Yeah. What what records are connected? Well, everything I know about love and bewitched. The songs are connected. I, in the lyrics to Bewitched, I say, so everything I know about love is basically about knowing nothing about love. It's kind of a play (laughs) on that. Um, But on Bewitched, one of the lyrics is, is, what's this new desire called? I didn't know that much at all about love, but now I'm learning. So Bewitched is kind of about learning more about it. And there's some musical quotes as well that, connect them like I reference uh, I reference some songs in album one that will appear in album two I love that (laughs) I'm building a universe (laughs) even though it feels like you're talking to somebody else are you really just talking to yourself kind of yeah it's very like I'm I'm journaling the same way that I'm writing do you still journal while you write or do you have you given up journaling for writing? No, not at all. The journaling is a crucial process of the writing. Will you reference journal for the song still? Yeah, absolutely. Well, because, you know, songwriting, it's like very, it feels, it's it's more intentional. Whereas like 
when you're journaling, I kind of just like let my mind go wild and I'll like repeat the same things three times and ask questions. And it's like a little bit more messy. But with that, when you kind of like lose that, you know, the seriousness of writing a song, you sometimes like get some stuff out of the journaling. So. How, of, how often will you journal? Um, I would say like once or twice a week. It depends on what's happening in my life. If there's a lot of cool stuff happening that I need, that I want to remember, or if I've like, you know, if I'm like, if I have a crush or something, <laughs> <laughs> then I'll definitely be journaling a little bit more. But yeah. Life is the answer to quality music, right? It's not falling in love or falling out of love. It's just living life. Yeah, I think so. You can listen to all of uh, Levy's music, by the way. It's chilling. Uh, in the description, waiting for you, it's all on Amazon Music. Uh, Bewitched is the album. It's coming. Oh, it's coming like, oh, no. Uh, I got, when is it coming? When is the album coming? It's coming September 8th. That's it, September 8th. Mm -hmm. I swear it's not in my notes for some reason. And I thought it was July 26th because, but that's when Bewitched came out. Right. The single. <laughs> and I'd be like, that's back in time. Yeah. That's, exactly. it's, that's not possible. Right, right. Yeah. S September 8th. But you, seriously, you can uh, tap the link, click the link in the description below, and you can get all of Leve's music. It's literally waiting for you. And you should listen to all of it because it's an incredible discography that when you consume it top to bottom, you really get to understand who you are. It's really cool. It's very much me person you can learn everything about me through that's what I told I started therapy the other day I'm no longer in therapy but the first thing I told my therapist you started it the other day but you're no longer in it yeah it didn't last that long but <laughs> I, I should probably go again but it was great she was great but I was just touring a lot and it was it was a bit of a mess but um <laughs> but I did tell her I was like well everything you need to know about me is in my discography <laughs> And then, and then she was like, that's not how I want to get to know you. <laughs> I was like, oh, right. I forgot. I'm not in an interview. <laughs> you know, but yeah, it's, it's very telling of how I think and how I experience life. <laughs> how often do you write? Um, it kind of depends. Like when I'm on tour, I'm not really much of a tour writer. I kind of just focus on performing when I'm performing. Um, I, when I'm, you know, busy on tour and stuff, I'll write kind of just when I feel like writing, which will be whenever something happens. How many songs did you finish to get this album? 15. You only, you finished 15? 15, like recorded, you, every single song that I recorded and produced for the album is on the album. Whoa. You didn't have like 20 and then have to narrow it no. down. Wow. I, have every, I don't have a single song that I've recorded that I haven't put out. I think there's one. There's one that I've recorded and didn't put out. And but. why hasn't that been put out? Um, I just, I'm not sure about that one. But everything else, I've been 100% sure of. And I feel like if I've put the effort and work into it and I like it enough, I may as well let it free. We talk to hundreds, maybe thousands of musicians. Almost everybody says they have hard drives filled with songs that the world <laughs> will never hear. We've never met somebody, right? right? It was the first time I've heard we've that. Really? We've yeah. never met somebody who releases everything. So what are you on? What about that song that's sitting there makes you unsure? Um, I don't know if it reflects my style exactly. It was a it was a co-write, and we kind of produced it out during that day, and and love the song, but I just don't think it reflects musically. Do you not do co-writes? I do. I do. Um, two of the songs on the album were co-writes. Um, one was with Dan Wilson. Cool. Um, that was Promise, and then. Another one is on the album as well. But um, I I love co-writing. I think I really, right now still, I'm still like so, I'm working so hard on this kind of jazz sound that I have, this leve sound that I'm, that I end up liking those songs the most and wanting to put those on the album. It's timeless. Oh. Like do not, like, whatever you're doing, just keep going. <laughs> because the truth is like some people get really, you know, they get, all this fame, and then they take every session that comes their way and every person that slides into their DMs, and it becomes, you know what I mean? It becomes something so much more that it's like... Yeah, I mean, I think there's so much beauty in collaboration, and I work really closely with my producer, Spencer Stewart, and he is like, I feel like we're like musical soulmates. Like, I did a couple of rounds of sessions when I moved here and and um, was finding like the best collaborators for me, and I found many great ones, but Spencer was just like... 
I remember my first session with him, I like walked away and I was like, oh my God, like I found it. Was this for the first album? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, he understands me so well and, and we build out string arrangements together and, and like uh, the album, most of it, we just did in his home studio and I, and you know, alternated playing guitar, piano. I play cello. He plays bass and drums. And sick. So aside from the symphony tracks and the one jazz standard, it was just us kind of playing around and and it's it's really fun. I can throw at him like the roguish like jazz or classical references or pop references, and he always gets it. And so I think he did a lot with like role model, right? Yeah, I, yeah, he I did. I also think he did uh, Jocelyn oh. by Olivia O'Brien. I've yeah. met him. Yeah, great yeah. guy. Yeah, he's the best. He's so so talented, and and yeah, he hadn't done any of this kind of music before. Before I met him, I remember walking into the session being like, this is going to be an interesting one. <laughs> and then I walked in and he had been on the same scholarship as me at Berkeley just Whoa. 10 years prior and had like studied film scoring and like jazz bass or something. But was like, you know, to the core, like a, just like a really good producer, like pop producer as well. So I was like, wait, oh, my God, like this is perfect. And it's been perfect. So I think that's another reason this album came out so fast. It was just, you know, I bring this these songs to him and, and he knows immediately what to do. Is cello the only instrument you're playing on the album? No, I play guitar and pian most of the piano and, and cello. Yeah. I've heard you say that cello is similar to the human voice. It is, yeah. Can you I kind explain of, that? Yeah, I kind of see the cello as just like like an extension of my voice. That's why there's so much cello on my recordings. <laughs> I I kind of feel as deeply about that as I do about my own voice. I think I also I was a cellist before I was a singer, so the way I sing is very much like the the way I play cello. It's very kind of a melodic instrument, and you know the vibrato and the timbre of it is very much like I think that of like a like a jazz singer almost and i've always had quite a deep voice and it's been just very very close by so by the way the way you just said those two words was the most legitimate way to say <laughs> those two words <laughs> like yeah like beautifully pronounced thank you <laughs> when you're arranging something how long does it take to get it just right and like when you look at a file like when you look at your session how many tracks is it? It's a lot of tracks because we layer a lot of harmonies and a lot of cello, like a lot of BGVs and cello. So sometimes I don't, I don't even know. It will end up being like qu quite a fat load, but, um, but it doesn't take too long. We kind of do it on the fly. Like I'll just sit there. Same with uh, the way that we go about BGVs is the same that we go about cello. Like I'll sit there with my cello, and I'll be like. I'll lay down the first line. I'll be like, I want this melody over it or this kind of pad. And then we just do three takes of that, choose another note, and build out a chord from there. And that's kind of, so we kind of do it on the fly. The Most of the songs on the album took like one to two days. Do you hear it in your head? Yeah. And at what point, like in the process of writing a song, do you bring in the instruments? Um, I always write a song start to finish, like just on guitar or piano, and then I bring it to production, and and then I, I usually have some sort of idea of what I want when I walk in. When you're arranging these for live show, are, am I going to get a different arrangement than I hear in the track, like the, the record? Um, Yeah, a little bit. I mean, it also depends, like, which show. Like, if I do a solo show, it's, of course, just solo and yeah. when i play um concerts with with orchestras oh, that's yeah, you yeah, get yeah. the orchestral <laughs> version um with with band it's usually you know it's me a drummer and a keyboard player so it's like a little bit more low key but we run some tracks as well and but i think i i'm pretty focused on making it as live of an experience as possible yeah so. how do you bring that to life with a band you need a fat band. Yeah, a fat <laughs> band. I mean, for you need last a fat tour. Budget. Yeah, I know. Um, last tour, we we ran some tracks, and then for I think New York and LA, we had uh, string players. Cool. And a harp as well. Um, for for this next tour that I'm going on, we're going to have 
it's going to be me. I alternate between piano, cello, and guitar. Oh, sick. And so I kind of like sit in a triangle. And then we have a keyboard player and a drummer. And we're going to have a string quartet for the bigger cities. Is it, uh, like, because that's what you do, is it hard or easy to find people who play to your standard? I think it's hard. It's harder, <laughs> definitely. Just because I was trained, you know, around so many string musicians so that's like because i know that so well so i'm like a bit like i i need that to be perfect yeah that's also i hear the strings as an extension of my voice you know so i i want that to be presented well with the music yeah like i need it to be of the same standard as like the classical music that i grew up listening to so but i've found great musicians so far so that hasn't presented an issue absolutely no pressure <laughs> No pressure whatsoever. Letter to my 13-year-old self. Does that, that, that Was that a real letter that you wrote? Uh, the, the letter is the song. <laughs> <laughs> the song is the letter, yeah. But do you write... <laughs> when do you realize that could be a song? Um, well, I think I was just thinking one day about how... I was thinking about... I saw like a photo of myself at 13 and just... I grew up in Iceland and I always felt really different. Like I'm half Chinese and I grew up partially in the States as well. So I always felt really foreign and loud and I like was a musician and I had this like loud, deep voice and I felt just kind of awkward and I didn't talk to boys and and I wanted to be a singer and but I didn't know that it was possible from the tiny island of Iceland and and I just wish that I could go back and just tell her, like a younger version of myself that like one day I'd be up on stage and little girls would be screaming my name, you know, that was kind of, it just made, that thought made me really emotional. So I thought I'd write that song kind of as a, as kind of a, a gift to myself, like to my younger self, but also hopefully like I have a lot of, you know, younger girls listening and I hope that they can kind of listen to that and think like, okay, I feel that way, and then, because I'm sure they see me now as, like, you know, I get to travel the world and play shows and, and you know, wear cool clothes and, and whatever, and and um, and I kind of want to remind them that, you know, I felt like that at 13, too, and, you know, just encourage little girls to chase their dreams as well. Messages like that have real impact that's kind of immeasurable. Yeah, I mean, that one, I truly, I was like, I don't care what people think. Like, that's going on the album, like, for myself. <laughs> um, but, yeah. And that one, I was very, I wanted it to sound almost reminiscent of me practicing when I was 13. So you can hear it's very, like, arpeggiated piano. And that one, I played guitar, piano, and cello on and and just kind of did did that whole thing. It just gave me goosebumps, yo. Yeah, I just. That's. Yeah. Really special. <laughs> I'm excited about that one. Um, what is it about K-pop that you appreciate? That that's a good question. I mean, I just like love New Jeans. <laughs> <laughs> I think their music is really great. You're a BTS fan too, aren't you? Uh yeah. I mean, this. Uh, yeah. I mean, I have. I've I've spoken to a uh, V of of BTS and and he's a fan and and I'm a fan of his of course. I think our albums are dropping the same day, which is crazy, <laughs> crazy coincidence. Um but yeah, he's like a big jazz fan and and um so I've kind of through that discovered discovered, you know, his music and BTS music as well and along with more K-pop. I think New Jeans New jeans, yeah, new jeans. Um, what do you love about new jeans? <laughs> I don't know. I think their whole project is just incredible. Like the the art direction behind it, and I think the music is great, and I think the whole message of it is is great. I think as an Asian woman as well, seeing all these Asian girls like get so much, you know, find so much success and 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 be seen everywhere is just really cool. Like it's it's like yeah, I think. I think that's also a part of it. I genuinely love that we live in a time where, yes, that representation exists and is thriving, but also in the same breath, K-pop could be equally as popular as the music that you have now brought back in a way that, like, has never been brought back before. Yeah. You're educating people on... The, the truth is the people who are listening to this music don't even know, most likely don't even know that jazz existed previous. I mean, they know something of it, but, well, that's like... That's kind of what I was counting on. Yeah, it's yeah. working, and it's timeless. 
I, I don't think I, all I hope to do. I don't think I've said to an artist in a long time that has come on our show that their art is timeless and their music can last and will last forever. No, it is. Oh, no, it's going to stand the test of time. Thank you so much. That's that's kind of the goal. I, I want to make music that, you know, can remind older generations of something they listened to when they were young and and is something just new for a younger generation and then something that can tie those generations together a bit as well. It's so beautifully honest, yet it still has moments where it's catchy and you can sing <laughs> it. And it's uh, the musicianship is just so at the forefront. It's... Thank you. Thank you. That means a lot coming from you. It's, it is, un, like, I'm so happy that this man who I went out on dates <laughs> with and now blocked introduced me to you. I, like, really, what a gift. I followed you on Instagram, and then you followed me back. I know. Well, I've, like, I, you know, I'm, I've been a fan of yours. I've, like, listened to your podcasts, and, and I... I don't, I don't remember what it was. I think I encountered your Instagram and I saw that you were following me and I was like, oh my God. I like texted my manager. I was like, did you know Zach Singh follows me on Instagram? And I followed you back. And now we're I mean, here. No, no, I'm, not. I'm not just saying that because you're sitting in front of me. That means a lot. Yeah. Mutual, by the way. Like, very, very mutual. I make my assistant listen to your music. All We drive in the car together for oh, hours. Poor assistant. No, she's great. She loves it. She, she better. She brought you in today. She's really nice. Oh. Kelsey. Oh, yeah. She's really sweet. Yeah, she's sweet. Yeah. What are you thinking, Dan? Well, I kind of want to touch on something you just said. Like, why hasn't jazz been considered, like, cool for a long time <laughs> for a younger audience? Well, my theory behind that is that it's just been kind of gatekept. Mm -hmm. I think it's something that's really scary for young audiences to approach. It's something that seems like it's only for an older generation or like the, the, the barriers to entry are so high. You feel like you need to be educated in jazz music to even speak about it. Mm -hmm. And the same with classical music. And, and even like I... I went to jazz school and I even feel sometimes small when I'm having conversations about it. So I've like, just like, and, but I love the music so much and I don't want that to be like the belief behind the music. I don't want it to be approached like that. Jazz music was created in the first place as kind of like a deviation from rules and something that was meant to be free and for everyone. So the fact that it's become something that feels like it isn't for everyone is, is kind of sad actually. And I think is is the death of the genre so is it felt like it's not for everyone because even the thought of instruments is less accessible than a computer yeah right like even down to that right like everybody can have a computer and make beats and get on right. fruity loops or pro tools or garage band and figure something out mm -hmm. but not everybody can get access to the education that uh, turns into becoming a mus musician yeah right? like you mm -hmm. you can't just pick up a trumpet today no not at all it's there's and it's it's expensive there's a lot of lots of barriers to entry that's and it that's such the right phrase yeah and you don't know like how do you consume jazz music uh, i barely know how to go to a jazz club <laughs> i think i went to a jazz i think the first time i went to a jazz club was the first time i played in a jazz club like a couple of months ago what? I'm not kidding. <laughs> yeah, they're like these little speakeasy things. They're speakeasies. Yeah. I was like, I don't know. Do I have to be 21? Like, it uh. doesn't really like you know. And and same with like the symphony. It's like I mean, I was literally like my mom plays in an orchestra, so I was in the womb, like on stage at the symphony. But it's such a scary place to enter into. It's like this big room. You don't know how to dress. You don't know when to clap. Like same with jazz. You don't know how to dress. You don't know when to clap. You don't know how do you buy tickets. Do you just show up or do you need to be 18? Do you need to be 21? There's all of these like confusing ways to get into it. And it repels younger listeners. Also, I think, you know, this Gen Z, young audiences don't want to, they don't want to listen to what adult, adults tell them to do. They just want to listen to someone their own age telling them what to do. And I think that's that's kind of what I realized. I was like, that's how I can get to a young audience. And, and how, how do you get to young audiences? Like, you have to use mediums that they're on, like social media. You have to use Instagram. You have to use TikTok, you know? And but You also have to be brutally honest because they can see through bullshit like nobody's business. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. But I think that honesty has worked so much in my benefit. Uh. Which is, yeah. is it not scary at all, though? Strangely, it isn't. I'm always waiting for it to, like, freak me out. But I think, you know, it, that's kind of how it has been from the beginning because I wasn't able to play live. So I, like, did a lot of live streams during COVID, that is. So I did a lot of live streams and I kind of, like, built this relationship with my fans via social media, which I think has 
given me just so much leverage as a musician and but also like giving me such an understanding of like how I present my music how I can you know present it to a young audience and not like repel them the same way that you know other jazz musicians maybe that it just doesn't seem as accessible you know what else helps having your audience be able to yell blah 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 at you during the middle exactly of a concert. It's like yeah they seem like a pop show with the jazz yeah show. no exactly <laughs> i i realized i was like i really am running like a pop show i realized that i was in i just did a round of shows in in asia and australia and and it somehow ended up being like the biggest rooms I've ever played. And I was playing them solo, which was interesting. But it was like all of a sudden there were like, you know, two, three thousand teenagers in front of me screaming along to a jazz standard. And I was like, wait a minute. Yeah, this is definitely something odd, um, but so cool, like amazing. It feels like and I don't think they really think of it as jazz music mm -hmm. or anything like that. I don't think people realize that, you know, from the start is like. A, a, a bossa nova record like i think to them it's just the song which is great that's that's what i want you know i want the walls of genres to go down a little bit by the way i i, I it is beautiful because the truth is like i do think that you can make the case that like the next generation of people don't see barriers or boxes or anything like that for a bunch of different like things in life music being one of them right yeah. like nobody nobody even it doesn't register that it's it, exactly jazz records well like in the olden days you'd go you'd walk into a into a record shop and you'd like go to your favorite section and you'd just stick to that right and it, it cost a lot of money to try listening to a jazz record or try listening to a classical a piece now there's like it's free to try listening to some new music right playlists on on streaming services aren't Necess they're not really split by genre they're split by like vibe yeah. <laughs> and mood it's like rainy day walking back home after a date after a glass of wine stuff like that and which marries together all these different genres of music and and i think that's i just think it's the best time to be a musician because you can mix all these things together and people don't really care look at taylor swift does whatever the hell she wants she literally does whatever she wants <laughs> she does yeah. whatever she wants and it works every time exactly, exactly icon 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 yeah that show was amazing yeah yeah it was so great <laughs> <laughs> I'm still fangirling. It was so phenomenal. She, that was a master class for me. It was a master class in performance. It's it, almost four hours, right? She goes. I like. I'm like a huge Taylor fan. I was singing along to every single lyric. My f my friends were surprised. They were like, "Whoa!" <laughs> I was like, "No, I know every lyric." Um, but I even like kind of clocked out halfway through a bit, and just like I was quite jet lagged actually. But and I came too. And there were like three eras left. And I was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> crazy. Going. Yeah, it's just, I mean, history. Yes. It's history. <laughs> it's her story. <laughs> her story is It's her <laughs> story. No, but I'm so in awe of, you know, she, she, in the very beginning, she brought country to like a brand new audience. And like, I'd never listened to country before, but I just love Taylor Swift. So I got to know country through that. And now I like country. Like... I'm not afraid to admit that. And um, and then she completely changes up into pop and then she's doing more folk. And I followed her through every single one because I just think her musicality is so great. And I'm also just so fascinated by how she's managed to reinvent herself so many times. And I think, you know, I kind of strive to do the same thing with jazz music, kind of like bring it back and make it into something that's not, uh, just kind of bring it to a new audience and a big audience. And... Um, I don't know if I'll, you know, go into other genres. I'm, I'm quite, you know, focused right now still on the, on the jazz stuff. But it's, it's fascinating. People what's, are there for her. What's the biggest difference between everything I knew, I know about love and Bewitched? I would say Bewitched. I, I just lean more into, into jazz and classical. I lean more into my roots, which is so cool. It's so fun, and it's, and it seems like it's been. I'm so I'm so surprised by the way that it's been received. It's like it's it's so rare that you hear examples of getting to lean into exactly the music you want to make and especially something that's a little bit rarer like jazz or classical and and have it be even more or more uh, better received than the last <laughs> than the pop stuff. I don't know. It's you know, I always expected people to I always expected that I'd come to some sort of crossroads where people would be telling me like, "Okay, like let's try." 
get you in some pop rooms, like work with this person. I've, I've been ready to like advocate for my jazz project. <laughs> I've never needed to. No, no one's told me to. It's, it's, it's so cool. <laughs> Don't fix what is not broken. No, I won't be fixing it. <laughs> Will we start posting on our photography Tumblr again? Um, just... You, you had a person, you, you had a, is this true? You had a photography oh, Tumblr? I did, yeah. Wow, where'd you dig that out from? We- <laughs> I forgot myself. Um, can we can we purchase any of these prints? <laughs> purchase any of these prints. Listen, growing up a kid in Iceland with like a camera, like you can get some nice stuff. Yeah. yeah. It's like the world is your play- playground, truly. What do you have, like the Aurora Borealis stuff? I have some Aurora stuff. Oh, I have, you- I have uh, lots of landscapes. You shout out the Aurora sky. Waterfalls. Black nice. sand beaches. Oh shit! Yeah, snowy peaks. I, I'd buy one of your prints. That's uh, thank you. First <laughs> of all, I'll have to find recover those those pieces of of work. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I I I think I mean I see my social media very much as that now. Like when I I post so much about my life, and I think social media is such a great way of it all ties together with my music. It's like social media is visually how I see the world and and my music is lyrically and musically how I see the world and your fans have a name now they do my little lovers I like that they're so cute I love my fans they name themselves yeah yeah well I put out a poll got it I was like we're we're uh, we're deciding <laughs> the fan base name today I was like choose wisely and I think I put out, there were two ideas that I'd like heard coming in a lot from fans. There was lovers, spelled L-A-U-V-E-R-S, and um, leaves, because leif means leaf in Icelandic, so yeah. there'd be leaves. I was like, that's really cute too. So I put out a poll. I was like, this is in your hands, like you figure it out. I've never had this much engagement on a post. Like there were <laughs> thousands, thousands of people that voted 50-50. 50-50. And I took a screenshot of it and I was like, this is a democracy. <laughs> and it stayed 50-50 for so long. And then I was like, okay, I'm, I'm just going to see what naturally starts to catch on. And Lover seemed to be the one that was catching on a lot. And, and so I just put my foot down and I was like, you're my lovers now. <laughs> and I am yours. <laughs> That's beautiful. Yeah. Uh, in my notes is live, laugh, leve. Yes. That's a that's a phrase that my my fans just 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 started saying one day at I the beginning it. of this year. I live that lifestyle, and it was yeah, it's a you know it's a lifestyle now, yeah. Um, and it was just repeatedly the top comment on every single one of my posts, and and um, and somebody was like, "We need live love, love." Or live, laugh, live, I merch. And I was like, okay, guys, like if I hit a million on TikTok, I'll make the merch. Mm. And um, and I did, and I made the merch. So, and now it's kind of become a, a phrase that kids like shout at concerts and <laughs> they have it on posters and stuff. And it's it's so cute. I, sp- I especially love it when they like, they just like, that's just them creating that. And and it's it's so cool. Are your parents proud? I think so. They have to be. I think so. They're very proud. You like something that is so deeply a part of their you know, like your your family lineage is now becoming. I don't know. You breathe new life into a whole genre of music that matters so much to them. I think yeah. I think my mom especially. Well, both my parents are very proud, but but you know my mom is the one who really like taught me to be a musician, and my grandmother as well. She's she's in Beijing. I'm playing in Beijing for the first time. <laughs> in in a month and and i'm going to see her for the first time since the actually for the first time in like a year or two and and to get to play there i'm playing with the china philharmonic it's i think like it's gonna be really really special but my (laughs) my mother grew up in a time and, and grandmother as well they grew up they were there during the cultural revolution in china and there were a lot of rules about what kind of music you could play and not and so they were trained in Western classical music and they weren't allowed to play cl- Western classical music. So um, they, they didn't play music for a while. And um, and so I think that the fact that I can play whatever <laughs> music I want and especially mix it up with whatever genres is, you know, I think they, they see a lot of beauty in that. Yeah, and to go back there and to do it all, like what? It's really special. 
I'm I'm really looking forward to it. That's really incredible. Yeah. Like if you do special. even if you do nothing else, which you'll go on to accomplish the most, that alone is Yeah, I'm I it's definitely gonna be a bit a pilgrimage for me. It's my first concert in China and or as a as as Leve the artist and singing my original music and it's it's gonna be very cool, I think. I grew I grew up going there every summer, so it's going to be like a it's gonna feel like going to one of my homes. Listen to Leve's music. It's all waiting for you. There's a link in the description below. You can listen to all of it on Amazon Music. What are you thinking, Dan? How often do people mispronounce your name? Um, I, I would say most of the time, but yeah. I totally expect it. Like, yeah. it's a very, you know, it's a common Icelandic female name, actually. But, you know, it's two vowels that are just don't exist in English. So, like, in true, like, clean Icelandic, it's pronounced Leve. And a and a are just like they don't translate in English. Nah, I, can't so. even, I can't even give you that sound. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So like the... the English version is Leve, um, but yeah, it's it's a name from Norse mythology. It's the mother of Loki. It's yeah, it was my great grandma's name. I have a couple of cousins called Leve. It's a family name, and and yeah, I never expect people to pronounce it correctly. Yeah, I I'm like, like I and I'm like honestly like I'd rather you pronounce it wrong than not pronounce it at all, you know. <laughs> there you go. So I I don't correct people when people are like I've heard come it, up to me and they're like, "Oh, are you are you Luffy?" Like, yeah. <laughs> I've heard people say that like numerous times. Like I've heard people say your name a thousand different ways. Yeah, you know, it's all a part of the intrigue. Yeah, I think it's a part of the story. It's it's it. it's you, you you say it however you want. It's the brand, baby. It's the brand. Yeah, people will figure it out one day. It's like Bjork. <laughs> All of Levy's music is waiting for you right now. Link in the description below. What are you saying? Nothing. I really can't thank you enough for your time. No, thank you so much for having me. It's been such a fun chat. <laughs> well, please come back as you know you release music. Oh my God, of course, if you'll have me. Oh, in a heartbeat. You have no idea. We're always here. We're always waiting. And uh, oh, one other question: Have yeah. other artists asked you to play on their albums? Mm. Yeah, oh. I've um, I, I've been really having fun playing cello on other people's projects. Like who? Um, well, I played, I've played on recently. I played on uh, one of Renee Rapp songs. Oh, cool. Been uh, Alexander Twenty Three. I've done Jeremy Zucker. I love Alexander Twenty Three. I love yeah. Jeremy Zucker. Jeremy Zucker. Um, this this girl Grace Anger, who's yeah been working with with alexander as well so talented i love her do you go to um, alex's house is that where you're working at yeah. his little back house studio yeah back also house his studio. bedroom <laughs> his bedroom yeah exactly yeah. yeah such a such a great hang and um charlie berg as well yeah cool. I'm, I'm having so much fun with it i'm i played on the uh, david i did a song with him and i played cello on that as well and yeah it's a great way for me to kind of be a part of records that i wouldn't necessarily you know sing in and I just love playing cello and spreading the cello word. So the gospel I'm, of cello. The gospel of cello. Yeah, I'm I'm having so much fun, like getting to do that as well. And yeah, I have a couple of fun collabs coming up. So I, that's so exciting. Like, will they yeah. be released? Obviously, separate from this album. Yes, they'll be separate from the album. But I'm really looking forward to them. There as is, a singer, there is a, a, a there is a feature on the album. It's the Philharmonic Orchestra. Yeah, it is. So. California and me. California and me. It's is this a cheer jerker? Is this your home now? It is. Do you, does it feel like home yet? It does. Yeah. Really? Yeah, I think so. I've been here for two years now. Um, I was definitely in a little bit of culture shock first. The first year's rough. For first everybody. year's weird. Yeah, and you kind of go through, you know, so so many feelings. And I'm really far away from my family. Like they live in Iceland, and my twin sister lives in London. So it was a bit difficult, but I. You know, I tour like over half the year now and I'm away a lot and I always enjoy coming back to LA. Like it's it's the best place to come home to and I love driving around in my car and listening <laughs> to music and going to the beach and just yeah, I, I think it's I, this is my home now. It feels like it. I appreciate you, Leve. I appreciate you too. Thanks for hanging out today. Thank you, thank you. All of uh, her music waiting for you. Link in the description below. Leve, everybody. Woo!